guys, welcome to the show. It's Friday. My name is Jerry Miller. We're live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville Network. It's great to be with you. The weekend around the corner, Friday, November 13th. How about that? A Friday the 13th during a pandemic in 2020. Yikes! A lot we're going to cover on today's program, including the story from Charlottesville tomorrow that basically calls Charlottesville an island of low COVID cases. We will compare and contrast the results for Mayor Walker's wants to lock down this community and close the economy. Yes, the mayor wants to lock down Charlottesville and close the economy again. We'll talk about that on the program. State Farm won't renew its lease on Pantops. A lot of people have in this conversation and the impact of not having hundreds of State Farm workers. I mean, how many people work at that location on Pantops? Does anybody know? Help me understand. What is the magnitude of the workforce at State Farm on Pantops, the Pantops campus? Am I right to say that the State Farm on Pantops was the second largest um, epicenters of State Farm employment in America? Am I right to say that? There's, is, it, is it Bloomington, Indiana that's number one? I think that's the home of State Farm, right? What is the amount of State Farm employees that work at the Pantops campus? That's what I'm asking you guys. If you know that answer, please put it in the feed so we all can be educated. The reason I'm bringing this up to you is because State Farm Corporate has said it will not renew its lease in Charlottesville, Virginia. So I want to know how many people work there, and if the lease is not renewed, how many people we potentially could risk losing from Charlottesville and Central Virginia's economy and ecosystem. Now, the argument could be made that these folks that work at the Charlottesville campus, they live in Charlottesville and Central Virginia, so the likelihood of them moving is slim to none because they're already entrenched in that community. That is a good point, and I can understand that. But I think you could appreciate, and bear with me, I think you can appreciate that as people are able to work remotely, why would people, as they're able to work digitally and remotely for a company like State Farm, would they choose not to move to a more affordable area and still maintain their Charlottesville State Farm salary? My brother-in-law is a digital nomad. He works for a ratings agency in New York City. However, he's allowed to work virtually. As a result, he is working for this firm up and down the eastern seaboard. He stayed at my house with my wife and his nephew, our son, for four months, staying in Philadelphia with his girlfriend, staying in Long Island with the parents. So if you're able to work remotely, the likelihood of you staying in one area that's expensive becomes less likely. Same situation we're seeing in big cities with people working remotely. The question I have for you, and I legitimately don't have that answer, so I'm hoping you can help me. How many employees work at the State Farm campus on Pantops? Because State Farm Corporate has said it will not renew its lease and its employees will be able to work remotely. I'm then going to extrapolate the employees and try to predict the impact it could have on Charlottesville and Central Virginia. We're also hearing the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, is leaving its current spot on Pantops. So a lot of news coming from the Pantops corridor. State Farm not renewing its lease. The DMV building up for sale. A lot of stuff that you're going to be hearing about from the traditional old school media outlets who are watching this program right now for news for their shows, their newscasts, and their television col their newspaper columns. Dom Starja is the head lacrosse coach at Blue Ridge School. This guy's a Hall of Fame coach, one of the best coaches in UVA lacrosse history. He unceremoniously was jettisoned from the University of Virginia. Some would say very disrespectfully, and by some, me, how Dom Starja was treated despite his tenure, his accolades, his hardware, his trophy, his victories, and the fact that he is a steward of UVA. How he was pushed out of the university was disrespectful. This man I have tremendous respect for. Now the lacrosse coach at the Blue Ridge School. We'll talk about that. We have an update on Mark Mincer, 
a couple of weeks ago on this show, Mark Mitzer, who lives in our neighborhood, friend of the program, a guy who was very kind to me when I launched this business, I Love Seville. Mark Mitzer back home with his family after brain surgery a couple of Fridays ago. We have a picture from Mark and an update from a guy that bleeds orange and blue. Um, Joe Biden, is he going to do a nationwide lockdown? His advisors are giving him perspective. We will pass along that perspective to you. The mayor of Charlottesville wants a lockdown of the city of Charlottesville. She said that clearly. Will Joe Biden do it? We'll talk about that on the program. How Live Nation, and Live Nation has a lot of ties to this community. Music Today, Live Nation, Corn Capshaw, Red Light Management. Live Nation, private business is trying to figure out how to solve COVID conundrum of having big groups of strangers in one place. We'll talk about how Live Nation and perhaps the Golden State Warriors of the National Basketball Association, how Live Nation and how the Golden State Warriors are helping mankind in solving the world's COVID problems. That topic coming up, and we'll take a deep dive into Miami and Virginia Tech, a football game that kicks off 12 o'clock on Saturday. You know the Hokies are playing number nine ranked Miami. Miami's ranked nine in the nation. Virginia Tech is unranked. Virginia Tech is a two point favorite in this 12 o'clock kickoff. Louisville and and the University of Virginia guys um, on the ACC network on Saturday as well with the Wahoos a three and a half point favorite. We'll give some love to Interstate Pest and Service Companies, truly a home's best friend. Interstate Pest and Service Companies, we're talking four generations of family, 51 plus years of proudly serving Charlottesville and Central Virginia. Andre Xavier, thank you very much for that. He thinks there are 800 employees at the State Farm on Pantops. We'll get to that story momentarily. Before Before we do, Charlottesville Tomorrow has put out a story, and let's get that on screen. The headline on that story, Charlottesville area becomes an island of low COVID cases while the rest of Virginia surges. We posted a screenshot of this story on our Instagram. That Instagram post has got over 300 um, people engaging with the post. You can get that screenshot from our Instagram on page. We encourage you to follow I Love Seville on Instagram. Coronavirus cases in Charlottesville, Virginia, and in Central Virginia, are very much in check. The Thomas Jefferson Health District has the lowest positivity rate in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The number of cases per 100,000 people is also extremely low. Charlottesville and Central Virginia have proven, we got to throw the University of Virginia in there as well, the Thomas Jefferson Health District as well, that we can manage this pandemic. We've proven it. Now we're going into tough times, the cold months. We're going into tough times, the holidays where folks from your extended family may be under one house. We're all fearful of a Thanksgiving and Christmas spread, very much like we saw spreads over the 4th of July. We understand that's on the horizon. But I find this story, I'm a cautious optimist, to be one that's empowering, one that's positive, and one we should rally around. An island of low COVID cases. Someone on our Instagram, in fact, it was the Oakhurst Inn. Maybe it was Bill Chapman who posted that. I think Bill Chapman is a witty guy, the owner of the Oakhurst Inn. He said, and put that, put that map on from Charlottesville tomorrow up again, if you could, Judah. He said, that map is a Cameron Webb election map, Oakhurst Inn. Basically saying Webb got all the strength and support in Central Virginia, and then as the 5th District spread, he didn't have as much support. As of right now, 447 people on our Instagram have interacted with this post. Now, let's tie that in into what the mayor of Charlottesville wants to do. Do you have those full screen pool quotes from yesterday that she said on our Facebook page yesterday, Judah? Can you reference those? Yeah. All right. Let me know when those are up. Give me a thumbs up if you could, please. Which one do you want? You can put them both on, and, and, and they can read the screen. And let me know when, when those are on there. That way you can, we can encourage folks to read the screen on, on what the mayor is saying. Okay, so look and read the screen now. It's on screen now. 
Commentary from her Facebook page, the mayor of Charlottesville. She wants to lock down the city. Very clear cut. She's saying it. She's pushing for it. She wants to do it. Multiple posts yesterday on her Facebook page. She wants a, an economic and business lockdown of Charlottesville. Clear cut. That's her agenda. That's what she wants. So I'm bringing the lead of the story and the lead of the show, Judah, is the Char Charlottesville Tomorrow article that basically says Charlottesville in Central Virginia is an island of low COVID cases while the rest of Virginia surges. Then I'm comparing and contrasting the data, the metrics, the numbers, something you can't argue with, facts. I love facts. I love statistics. I love data. I love numbers. I use facts and statistics and data and numbers to help determine the decisions I'm going to make in life. You know what that is called? It's called being a reasonable thinker. Data, right here, COVID, stats and numbers from the Thomas, Je Thomas Jefferson Health District. The stats and numbers say, Charlottesville and Central Virginia, A-OK, -okay, doing all right, things looking cool, we managing this. The leadership on council, ignoring the data, instead making decisions based on no facts, instead choosing to offer commentary on social about economic lockdowns. Data, opinion. You see? You see? That's why we have the data. That's why we have months of it. It's to make reasonable and intelligent decisions. And lockdowns only hurt the most vulnerable. We know that. Our next story should be one that all of us should follow closely. State Farm has chosen, chosen not to re renew its lease. Andre Xavier, friend of this program, visionary, businessman extraordinaire, says it's roughly 800 people that works at that State Farm campus on Pantops. Anyone? Anyone? Is that right? Is 800? I don't know the number. Andre is very connected and has his pulse on things. He says it's 800. I trust him. Is that right? 800 people at the State Farm on Pantops? Right now, State Farm corporate is saying, work virtually. You don't have to come into work. We're not going to renew our lease. Now, our hope as Charlottesvillians, our hope as Albemarle Countyans, our hope as Central Virginians is these 800 well-paid individuals choose to remain in the community and just work virtually, remotely, digitally, through Skype and Zoom from their home, their offices at, the, at their casa, okay? Maybe a Zoom room at their house, we hope. And then the money and the economic impact stays within our community. But if you think about the largest employers in Charlottesville and Central Virginia, State Farm's got to be what? Top 25? How many employers can you name that have 800 plus in people? Of course, the University of Virginia, right? Of course, UVA, right? How many others can you name that have a depth or a, a robustness of employment roster like 800 plus people? Does, does, does SNL? Do they? Uh, Martha Jeff probably does, right? I think Martha Jeff does. SNL, maybe? I don't think Co-Construct has 800. Am I wrong? I don't think CC Co-Construct has 800. So you're talking about top 25, maybe even a mistake. Is State Farm one of the 10 largest employers in Charlottesville and Central Virginia? Help me. Educate me. Help me understand. Am I wrong in reading this? What are the 10 largest employers in Charlottesville or Central Virginia? UVA is a clear-cut one. What do you got? In no particular order, a Martha Jefferson Hospital, in Almaro County, just the municipality in totality, Almaro County, City of Charlottesville, municipality in totality, all the employees employed by the City of Charlottesville, schools and teachers and police and, 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 and folks maintaining the municipality, right? They got to be up there. Who else can beat 800 people? Legitimate question. Serious question. SNL, maybe? When one of your top 10 largest employ employers in your area says, we're not going to renew our lease, 
and our 800 and some employees can work remotely and virtually, the fear you have is that remote and virtual work converts to these individuals moving outside the area, continuing their job, but choosing instead to move to a place like Waynesboro. Right? Shenandoah Valley. Lower cost of living. More bang for your buck. And next thing you know, the disposable income of these 800 plus people could potentially go to a different city, a different municipality, as opposed to our tax base and opposed to the 200 million needed to run the city of Charlottesville and the 400 million roughly you need to run Almaro County. Follow it. Keep an eye on it. Think about it. Understand it. Feel it. It's important. These are the type of things that impact schools, roads, municipalities, and the budgets they have to work with to keep things heading in the right direction. Speaking of State Farm, speaking of Pantops, are you hearing the DMV building is for sale? You following that? DMV building for sale. Now, our friend, Neil Williamson, who is a very sharp man, who follows this very closely, he let us know on Real Talk with, with Keith Smith earlier today on this network that the DMV will be in its current location until 2022. After that, Chicos and Chicas, it's up for grabs. Follow it. Understand it. Know it. See what's happening and see the impact it could have on your community, on our community. Speaking of community, a steward in Central Virginia has got a new gig. Now let's be honest, this man doesn't need to work anymore. His name is Dom Starja, the former lacrosse coach at the University of Virginia, a national champion, and just an all-around solid guy. Now, unfortunately, he got caught up in that, uh, that, that Hughley stuff, the murder of Yardley Love, and by caught up, I mean the, the outside optics where it was a program of debauchery, of partying, of alcoholism, and of silver-spooned wealthy players that were running amok across grounds at the University of Virginia. Now, I want to cut to the chase. How he was pushed out of his job, disrespectful to him. But the concept of silver spoon highly inebriated individuals running amok within the lacrosse program? I'll cut to the chase. That's much of the student body at the University of Virginia. So for one person to fall on a sword for the act of a horrible, 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 horrible individual is disrespectful to the man who's been leading that program for so long. Long story short, Dom Starch is now the coach at the Blue Ridge School in St. George. What's he going to do? He's going to get that program pretty darn good. On top of that, he's going he's to reach out to all the other lacrosse programs, private schools in this area, and he's going to make amends. He's going to get them playing each other. This is good for lacrosse in Central Virginia. Dom is the godfather of lacrosse in Central Virginia. So for him to get this job at the Blue Ridge School is something pretty positive for everybody that follows this sport in the region. And Dom, from a personal standpoint... I miss chatting with you. I miss seeing you on the sidelines. And I miss seeing you take young men and making them the best versions of themselves on the lacrosse field and off the field as well. Next headline, Judah Wickhauer, I want to cover is something from Mark Mincer. Mark Mincer, um, a couple of Fridays ago, had brain surgery. This guy's a stand-up dude. Get the photo from it. It's on screen. Look at the screen. Here's a wonderful photo of Mark Mincer on screen at his house with his family post-surgery, recovering. This is the man, Mincer's on the UVA corner in Stonefield. This is a guy who bleeds orange and blue. Twelve and a half years ago when I started this business, I have the I Love Seville trademark that's backed by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. No one can use this trademark besides me. If they do, they get sued. And you have to do it to protect your trademark. Wegmans felt the pain. They felt the pain, and they did a payday to our company for infringing on our mark. 
I went in there 12 and a half years ago with this trademark and paper in hand, and I said, what can I do with this? What should I do? And Mark took me into his back room at Minster's on the UVA corner, and for about an hour, he chatted with me about all the possibilities of this trademark. Now, we chose to go a different road and make the trademark more about digital and social and news and content and less about merchandise and brick and mortar retail because we saw the future was this and content for news feeds on these, which is the phone. But he didn't have to spend an hour with me chatting about the possibilities of a trademark. He did because he's kind. Now he's back. Put the screen, the, the picture back again. And I say all the best to this man. All the best to this man. Susan Steinmart is coming up. I still have to talk about a Joe Biden, the president-elect. Is he going to do a nationwide lockdown? How a live nation that's very much rooted in the foundation of Charlottesville music today, how live nation could be helping the world, how the Golden State Warriors could be helping the world. David Varel is watching. Are you watching in the Outer Banks, David Varel? I love you, man. I miss you, man. We need to get that cold beer soon. Get your boy Wesley in the mix, too. David Varel says, Jerry, S&P. You're right. It's not SNL. It's S&P. S&P is 500 people. Yona Smith says, Injik is one of the top employers. Neil Williamson has put the big 50 largest employers on the feed. I love you, Neil Williamson. Neil Williamson got a pie from the pie chest today, courtesy of Keith and Yona Smith on Real Talk. Top 50 employers, according to Seville Weekly, June 1, 2018 article. Neil Williamson just put this on the stream. This is what I love about social media being used for the, for the best. I'm learning from you guys on the show, and then I'm passing along this knowledge to others so you, you learn as well. Top 50 employers in Charlottesville and Central Virginia, a 2018 article from Sevo Weekly. So UVA is one and two. University of Virginia and the Medical Center, they separated Virginia and the Medical Center into two different ones. We said UVA was one, we were right. County of Albemarle is in the three spot. I think we call that as well. Centera Healthcare, that's Martha Jefferson. We call that as well in the four spot. City of Charlottesville's in the five spot. So the top five employers we called here, City of Charlottesville, number one's UVA, number two's UVA, three's County of Almora, four Centera Healthcare, that's Martha Jefferson, five is the City of Charlottesville, six is UVA Health Service Foundation. So UVA is one, two, and six. Seven is State Farm, boys and girls. Thank you, Neil Williamson. This is what I should have had before the show started. I appreciate you, sir. Seven is State Farm. 2018 Seville Weekly, the seventh largest employer in the area, State Farm. Eight is Charlottesville City School Board. That can't be right. It's gotta, is that the teachers as well, Neil? Eight, the Charlottesville City School Board? It's got to be the teachers as well. The Department of Defense is nine. That's Injik with what Jonas Smith was saying. Good call, Jonas Smith. You came in in the ninth spot. Very good call, Jonas Smith. Ten, Fluvanna County. Um, Fluvanna County's in the tenth spot. Service Link Management Com Inc. in the eleven. Walmart. Walmart's got a hell of a lot of employees. Not just the retail, but the distribution centers as well. Walmart in the twelve. Food Line in the 13, ACAC in the 14. I can assure you they're no longer 14 because of this pandemic. They're no longer 14 highest uh, amount of employees because of this pandemic. Region 10, 15, Piedmont, Virginia Community College, 16. Green County schools in the 17th spot. Kroger, 18. Lakeland Tours, 19. And top 20, Northrop Grumman. So they're your 20 highest um, from an employee count. Guys, State Farm was the seventh largest employer as of June of 2018. If you're not following the fact that corporate State Farm has said Charlottesville State Farm will not renew its lease, and if you're not following the fact that all these employees now can work virtually, remotely, anywhere they want in the world for their job, and if you don't think that's a serious story... You're reading different tea leaves than me. Thank you for that list. Free Enterprise Forum, Neil Williamson. Very grateful. Um, 
Let's reach out to Susan Steinmark. All right, Susan, we'll try it via Skype. If Skype's not working with Susan, we'll get her on the phone um, and do a conference call, Judah. I'm Skyping her now. Let's see if we can get her via Skype. Oh, I think we got it. Let's see if we got the mic, the audio going. All right, Susan's on the line. Kipasa, Susan, how are you? I can hear her. Judah, can you hear her? I think we got this figured out. Judah can't. Can you guys hear on the line? I, we can hear you. All right, Susan, you're live. All right, you're a, uh, you're a smart lady, and I'm going to flip the script on you here, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this I is... really appreciate getting a chance to chat with you guys about our social equity game. We talked uh, about that early on. Before, and... before, before we talk about that, before we talk <laughs> about that, I want to pick your brain on some things. Oh, sure, sure. Okay. Um, cool. Give us some, give us some um, insight into your background before the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust. Well, well um, I've done a lot of different things. Jane of all trades. Yeah. yeah? Um, I worked for many, many years with El Morro County's economic development programming. That's so what that I want to was... talk about. That's what I okay. want to talk about. Okay. So Susan Steinmart knows El Morro County and its economics and its economy very, very well. I think that's safe to say. Can I say that? It, you can say I know some things. <laughs> okay. She's being <laughs> humble. She's being humble. She is a brilliant lady, and you're about to see her brilliance here. State Farm not renewing its lease. 800 and some employees in Al Morrow County, Susan Steinmart, now have the opportunity to work remotely and virtually. Anywhere yes. you want to go on this topic. Well, it's been a, a journey for State Farm for many, many, many years. Um, the community was so lucky that State Farm picked Albemarle County roughly 15 years ago, maybe closer to 17 years ago, to locate what they called, um, if they don't want to call it a corporate hub headquarters, they'll call it a corporate hub. Um, world, uh, let's see, it's CFA, uh, Certified Financial Planners, that institute, CFA Institute, that is also a, um, a hub, not a headquarters. So, but going back to State Farm, they've enjoyed many, many, many years in our community, at least 17, it could be longer, and they've done some great things with travel demand management, like they've used a lot of shuttles so that their traffic impacts uh, were not as great as they would have been otherwise in the Pantops community. So I can't say enough about State Farm. They've been such a great corporate citizen in terms of helping out all sorts of charitable causes, participating in all the county's economic development and planning programs. They've been a big champion of the master plan, the Pantops master plan. 800 jobs could be going to remote status. That's, that's a definite possibility if they don't renew their lease. And, and that means that those folks would continue to work from their homes. They're not necessarily leaving the community. And those folks may choose if you know, working from home is not a very enjoyable option for them. Maybe they have small children at home or pets that get in the way. Maybe they will voluntarily lease space somewhere in the Pantops area. So it could be replicated. The folks from the State Farm Division here in town or the hub, they didn't necessarily go out for lunch and patronize a lot of lunchtime businesses, as you might imagine other businesses do on the downtown mall. They have a huge cafeteria in that operation, and they were typically only given about 30 minutes for lunch. So that meant a lot of them pretty much ate at their desks. So I'm just, I'm just giving them some aspects of their operations that I'm aware of. Um, That's it legit. Is it is a big deal, but I think the community will be fine, and I think they'll find other uses for that building if it's not the State Farm operations. I love this lady. This lady knows a lot, uh, a lot about a lot. And she's an extremely good communicator. I'm going to throw this to you. How does, okay. how does economic development, how does the process work of attracting a campus that has 800 employees like State Farm? Um, something that immediately came to mind was the, um, and I'm drawing a blank, was it Deschutes? Remember Deschutes? When yes, they tried to come to Almora, right? Um, right at that 29 South um, exit. 
I was a yeah. huge fan of Deschutes. It was 100 plus jobs. It was a place that could uh, sustain the infrastructure. I thought that was a no freaking brainer. Now, the Board of Supervisors saw it otherwise. The Deschutes ended up going to Roanoke for their tap room instead of building their facility here. They never built their, their facility in Roanoke like they actually had because they had some economic difficulty, but the plan was kiboshed by leadership in the county. So the question I have for Susan, who's got experience doing this, how does this process work of economic development attracting a big employer to the area to drive the economy? Um, it's it's a, a bit of a challenge because that employer is going to have unique needs and circumstances. Deschutes was a wonderful prospect to work with. They are an employee-owned company. So that's another aspect. That decision-making isn't just held in the hands of a CEO and the shareholders. That decision is now held in the hands of even the employees. Um, we have several employee-owned companies in Albemarle and Charlottesville, which is really cool. So they were an employee-owned company. They would travel as a group to look at the different site options in Virginia and elsewhere. And so I got a chance to meet some of the team members. Um, and then it's just about getting to know what is important to that prospect. And so for them, they really, really, really enjoyed our community because they are big time foodies. And outdoors, um, and outdoors. And outdoors. A lot of their team members were into um, mountain biking and hiking. And um, they saw a lot of similarities between their operations in Oregon and what we have to offer in our neighborhood. So it was really enjoyable. But so every, every prospect has got their own unique corporate culture and unique needs. Um, you can say that it's about cheap land. Ultimately, Deschutes decided that, you know, we are going to go with this Roanoke option because the land is cheaper. Uh, this community was getting ready to give them some property. But I don't think that's the only factor. There are a lot of other factors. Availability of workforce and talent is really important sometimes, depending on what they're trying to do. And that's where we would have partnered with our community college partners at PVCC and um, worked on bolstering the existing Zemergy or beer making program. And, and then we even, you know, looked at some of the speci special things about uh, brewery activity where you have a lot of wastewater and you have a lot of byproducts. What do you do with all those? So we had special meetings with the um, Rivanna um, Sewer Authority to see how they could process some of those byproducts. So it just depends on the company, Jerry, what's going on with their operations and what they need from a community. Um, it's not always just land. It's not always just workforce, but those are big ones. I love this lady. This lady knows so much about so much in this community. Um, who is, anywhere you want to go on this topic, Almoral County, which you know very well, most influential employers and why in Almoral County not named the University of Virginia. Stuff you've seen <laughs> firsthand, not named UVA, okay? And why, stuff you've seen firsthand and their impact on this area. Wait, so you're, you're saying UVA's impact on this I'm area? I'm saying excluding UVA. We excluding take, UVA. U, take UVA out of the equation, most influential employers you have seen from your time in economic development. Well, that is an, a very interesting question in the sense that the employers from my tenure, and it's, it's, a, it's a changing world, so I can't say that it's how things are today, but while I worked with the county, <clears throat> the employers didn't really have a very strong voice. Even the chamber would come forward and give their opinions, but um, it's a very democratic community that we live in where um, uh, Alex, homeowner, has just as important a voice as... Um, Mr. George, CEO of X company. It, so it, it was very democratic, and I really can't say that one employer really dominated. Um, I, was, I was very impressed at the balance and fairness that the Almaro County Board took with every, each and every proposal that came forward for review, whether it was you know, uh, rezoning or special use permits or things of that nature. Um, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, Jerry, this is a community where it is fairly balanced. Um, I know Almoral County is gaining more and more respect for its employment base, and uh, the new economic de development director, Roger Johnson, is doing a lot of good work trying to bring forward some of that um, under a special grant program called Go Virginia. So, yeah. 
Uh, I, I know that's not the answer you wanted if there's one employer, but it was something that actually struck me that there really wasn't one employer that carried so much weight. Now, the University of Virginia. Right, except UVA. Does have lots of cooperative agreements yeah. with both the city and the county to work on lots of different levels, including emergency communications responses, um, certain uh, uh, financial agreements on, on different types of property ownership. University of Virginia has basically got three different ownership structures with Albemarle County. Um, foundation level structure, um, university public land, state owned land, things like that. So, what are the three well, structures? You're, yeah. you're teaching me. What are the three structures? So, some of the University of Virginia real estate is owned by the state of Virginia. Other properties, essentially under control of University of Virginia, are owned by the Real Estate Foundation. So, there's different tax structures related to each structure. And then there's a third one that is um, a hybrid of the two, I think is the best way to put it. So you can't always assume that because it's got UVA connected to it that they're not paying property taxes. Because, in fact, if it's owned by the foundation, they are paying property taxes, for example. Susan Steinmart, you're dropping knowledge bombs over here. I love when this lady comes on the program. Okay, one more question before the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust, and I want to spotlight the efforts you've done. Last question here on Almoro County. We have a, a, a budget deficit in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, economic development is one of your fortes along with connecting with people, fundraising, organizing, being a leader, keeping your chairman on track, which is no easy task. Uh, you have a lot of many talents over here, Susan. Economic development in Albemarle County facing a budget deficit for fiscal year 2021 and potentially fiscal year 2022. What would your advice be to drive economic development for the county of Albemarle? Oh, um, I think stick to the plan. They have a very good economic development plan. They have a really good understanding of the data. And then maybe complement that with this business grant program that they've already rolled out. There may need to be some more resources uh, put out there to help prop up a few businesses that are struggling. Um, I know that the business grant program was a really good start and they may need to do more of that. And then um, helping, you know, with working with Department of Public Health to make sure that the COVID impact is getting contained. Um, we're all waiting for that vaccine and we're all trying to be as safe as possible. And that's the thing. We don't want to have to go back and close operations because of COVID. So that's that's my number one, how to be as safe as possible and continue doing our business. There you go. Fifty six thousand dollars. Was that the final number? Uh, closer to fifty seven. $57,000 for the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust. Wait till you hear this story. Susan, the show's yours. Yeah, so, you know, Jerry, we started this off with an idea, um, bringing in the game of Monopoly as our model, but then flipping it upside down and saying, how do we promote social equity? It's a land trust home. The land trust home is helping individuals trying to break into that barrier of home ownership and start to build equity, not just for themselves, but for their, for their families, generational wealth. So we ended up dividing into four teams. Um, team Nassau, I'm happy to report, had the highest fundraiser. Team Monticello had the highest impact in terms of number of donors. And then Team Franklin had the highest impact in terms of social media exposure, 35 new donors and, um, and your viewership. So that was really great. Um, and then another important statistic for fundraising efforts, people like to talk about, well, what did the, what did the nonprofit organizations spend? To be able to engage in this fundraising. There's always some sort of ratio and always some consternation about, oh, they spent so much money. Well, at the end of the day, we spent about $1,000. That's amazing. It would roll this program forward. So that was a really good uh, return on, on our efforts. And then, so you got, um, you got 57x your, your output. She spent 1000 and got 50, roughly 57000 I mean, that's amazing. You should get props. Yeah, so, and, and, and I hats off to the teams because they were each given a goal for 5,000 and each team exceeded their goal. So how fantastic is that? Um, and then, at Jerry, as you may remember, we celebrated with a celebrity poker game at King Family Vineyard last weekend. And I'm, I'm a little worried that we may have spawned Affordable Housing Gamblers Anonymous. <laughs> Everyone had so much fun. It was so much fun. So there may be a repeat of that. Who won um, the poker tournament? Uh, it was uh, Anthony Woodard of Woodard Properties. Wow. 
Yeah, and shout out. Is to that Anthony. is that Keith's kid? Is that Keith's kid? It is. Wow. It is. And um, yeah, he was hilarious because he was sort of the the quiet dark horse there for a long time. All of a sudden, he pulled it together. So that was pretty surprising. Um, King Family Vineyard did an amazing job keeping everyone safe. The poker game was structured so that got, folks got a chance to eat some food, clean their hands, and then step away to antimicrobacterial playing cards. So we were really, really safe, and I think it paid off for everyone. They had a great time. I'd actually like to take a minute, Jerry, and just thank some of our corporate donors. Please. Um, Tiger Fuel, Fulton Bank, the Oakhurst Inn, King Family Vineyards, Afton Mountain Winery, Martin Horn Construction, Woodard Properties, as we mentioned, Mark Mascot, and McLean Faulkner. So those are heavy and, hitters. Yeah, and and um, and then I Love Seville did a great job in helping us out too. So thank you for that. And and I just want to say, by all measures, um, super successful. But I also want to point out that some of our bigger donors came from a company. Going back to what you started the show with about economic development, Micro Enterprises. This was a special company here in Charlottesville, one of Almaro County's premier manufacturers. Um, through direct hires and local partnerships, they had created over 250 advanced manufacturing jobs in our area. And people don't know about this company. Several of their um, their folks reached out to the land trust, recognizing the impact of affordable housing in being able to meet their needs. And they were they were larger donors. So hats off to the teams from uh, Micro Enterprises. Um, I want to mention that because I think it's important that people recognize that the employers care about affordable housing. All of those employers that we just talked about, they care about affordable housing. And I know that at, early on when we first started talking on the show, we talked about how the land trust was a little bit weird. But in reality, is it, is it really weird? I've uh, got some research from one of our um, team members, um, a graduate student from the Batten School of uh, Public Policy, Ian Baxter. He did some research for me. He looked at the almost 200, no, I guess it's more than 250 land trusts in America. So it's not that weird. Um, 32, uh, or sorry, 13% response rate. And one of the questions we asked the other land trusts were, how do you get your funding for land acquisition? And you'll be surprised to see how some of those local governments really stepped up. They had their um, housing trust fund. They had set aside housing, um, affordable housing funds to use um, any uh, the developers' cash contributions toward land acquisition. They were taking um, monies from the general fund in a certain locality. One locality surveyed had local legislation. I'll just read it out because it's a little bit tricky. Um, they had um, revenue from city real estate property, and they set up um, a surcharge up to 3% to go into the land trust. Um, something that's just starting to get used in Charlottesville and Almaro is called tax increment financing, which is basically giving a, um, a base rate, and then any uh, increased value goes back to affordable housing. Oh, tell me that again. What, what does that mean? So they establish a base year tax rate for a specific zone in an area, and they use any increased value toward um, a real estate fund to fund affordable housing. Okay, okay. So is that, that's happening now here? It, it, so where it's been used in Albemarle and Charlottesville is to provide, um, I would call it, a tax refund back to employers. At the beginning of the show, you wanted to ask about what is important for employers who are trying to locate a larger operation, tax increment financing can be really valuable. Um, that's something that's been used in Albemarle County by a couple of select employers and, and one affordable housing project. So that's pretty cool. You are awesome. Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there for any of our local officials and uh, community members who think that affordable housing is important and maybe want to think about some more permanent financing. Because we know the social equity game was great. We know that poker games are great. But, at the end but of the it's day, not consistent revenue that you can budget and plan for. And every exactly. business and entity exactly. needs cash flow that can budget and plan for so it can run its operations. And if you get that baseline of cash coming in from the city or the county, then the poker game and the revenue that comes from that is just gravy or icing on the cake. Right. 
Exactly, Jerry. You, I couldn't have said it better. So, so, so anyway, why, why won't mention, government do that? Well, the, the city of Charlottesville, to their credit, did set up an affordable housing fund. <clears throat> and then when COVID hit, they closed it. Okay. So we're hoping it reopens. Okay. We're hoping it reopens. And then in the city's affordable housing policy, draft policy, they're getting ready to um, move forward toward publication. One of the recommendations is for a, um, a housing trust fund, which would be a benefit to our entire region um, if, if other localities joined on board to having a housing trust fund in our area. I love it. I love it. Did Keith tell you the idea of raising 150 k in a live auction? I, I think that's pretty amazing. Oh, my gosh. How, we've got to get going I, on I, that. I, we, we've got to get going on I, well, that. Well, what we need, you and I need to go one-on-one, -on -one and we'll, like, dot the I's and cross the T's. But I think we can do okay. a bone 50 through a 24-7 live auction. Wow. Oh, my God. That would be amazing. Um, that would get us to the uh, finish line of 13 homes, possibly 15 homes. On Temp homes. Street, right? It would be between three different locations. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got five set up for 10th Street, another eight for uh, Monticello and Carlton, and then another two in another location. I mean, the, the momentum is building is what I'm trying to share with you, Jerry. The momentum is building I, for the land trust. I've said this on the show many times, and it's got me on tr in trouble many times. I think you guys might be my favorite nonprofit in town. Ooh, I know. Wow. I catch a lot of grief. No, but I think, I mean, what you're doing is just like. There are a lot of good ones. There's Jerry. a lot of good ones. I know. And I make, <laughs> I make claims like this often. They get me in trouble. I think they're the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust is my favorite nonprofit. They're making like generational impacts here. And this lady I've gotten to know through this show and through Keith Smith. She's freaking awesome, man. She's like on her A plus game over here. And Smith's probably saying like, Jerry, pump the brakes on what you're saying with Susan here. You're giving her too many props, but you are awesome. You are awesome. Um, I look forward to Fridays. I appreciate the knowledge. I'm going to pick your brain in future Fridays on economic development and the land trust because you have so okay. much to offer okay. on economic development. Um, I'll okay. also follow up with that email about the live auction, and we'll get something on the books for, uh, you know, soon, soon. Soon. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's going to be a holiday thing. Yeah. It's going to oh, be a No. Is it? We're in November, December. Oh, man. We uh, might be able to do it. All right. I'll shoot you an email. We might be able to do that. Okay. All right. All right. All right. You have great, a good one, great, Susan. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. Take right. care. Susan Bye. Susan Steinmart is awesome. So uh, speaking of economic development, and she's fantastic. She previously worked in economic de development for Amor County. One of the things that I would do, and you guys know I have aspirations to be um, give back, some kind of you know, civic duty, some kind of service back to the community. Uh, maybe that first step is Board of Supervisors. Maybe that first step is 5th District. We don't know. But if it was Board of Supervisors, one of the initiatives that I would try to champion and propose, well, there, there are a couple. But one of them would be economic development during COVID. We must do a better job of leveraging sports and outdoor tourism. I'm seeing the impact that sports and outdoor tourism are having on the Richmond market, soccer tournaments, pickleball tournaments, bicycle races just come immediately to mind. Can you imagine some kind of tournament soccer, some kind of tournament tennis, pickleball, some kind of joint venture JV with UVA, maybe some kind of mountain biking race at Walnut Creek that, that rallies the central, uh, the Charlottesville area mountain biking club, Cambic in the mix and someone like a Peloton station or a, a, like a Blue Wheels bicycle, whatever it may be. Um, what I would do if I was in a position of some kind of leadership and I have aspirations of doing it is to leverage new ideas like outdoor and sports tourism during a COVID standpoint to drive incremental economic development value to this market. That's something that I think we're underperforming in right now. If you agree or disagree, let me know. Put it in the feed. A couple things I need to get to before I get to your comments. I will get to your comments here on the show. Remember, the show is archived on every social media platform possible, including ilovesevil.com, every podcast possible on Instagram. We have the largest reach of any brand in the area. It's, you can't even argue it, man. It's not even arguable how much people we reach versus NBC 29, any of them. We reach more people than any, you can't even debate it. It's not even a conversation. So if you're missing the live, you can find it anywhere archived. Joe Biden's economic advisors on a lockdown. 
Everyone is fearful that this guy's gonna do, a, a lot of us are fearful that this guy's gonna do a lockdown, the president-elect. His economic advisors, this article on CNBC a couple of hours ago, 90 minutes ago, his economic advisors are advising the president-elect that a, a, a nationwide lockdown is not the right choice. His economic advisors, his policy and COVID advisors, his pandemic advisors, are presenting to him that a nationwide lockdown is not the right choice. I'm gonna leave it at that, but I wanted to relay that to you. Here you got presidential elect advisors saying no lockdown, and here you're saying the data from the Thomas Jefferson Health District, no lockdown. Facts, facts for decision making. Please, please. Live Nation could be solving the world's COVID problems with big groups gathering together. Live Nation, Music Today, Red Light Management, Corn Capshaw, this company very much woven into the fabric and identity of the Charlottesville and Central Virginia community. Here's how it would work if it's approved. After you purchase a ticket from Live Nation for a concert, the person who purchases the ticket would need to verify that they have the COVID vaccine. The COVID vaccine would offer protection from COVID-19 for one year. You buy a ticket, as soon as you buy a ticket, you verify that you've gotten the vaccine. Your next step is to prove a negative COVID test between 24 to 72 hours of the concert starting. Buy a ticket, show you got the vaccine. After you got the vaccine, show a COVID test that's negative 24 to 72 hours before the concert starts. The length of coverage a test would provide would be governed by regional health authorities. If attendees of a Friday night concert had to be tested 48 hours in advance, most could start the testing process the day before the event. If it was a 24-hour window, most people would likely be tested the same day of the event at a lab or a health clinic. Once the test was complete, the fan would instruct the lab to deliver the results to their health pass company like Clear or IBM. The test, if the tests were negative and the fan had the vaccine, the health pass company would verify the attendee's COVID-19 status to Ticketmaster, which would then credibilize the ticket for the event. A lot of people are saying Live Nation and private business is solving how people will get together in large groups that are strangers for concerts and basketball or sporting events in a COVID world. Buy a ticket, send your vaccine, the fact that you got it. 24 to 72 hours of the event, get tested. Show again you don't have COVID. Give the results of the vaccine and the negative test to Ticketmaster and your ticket is credibilized and you can go in the event. You can't go into the event until those data points are met. Ticketmaster, Live Nation, could be solving how large groups get together in a COVID-19 landscape. The Golden State Warriors of the National Basketball Association have submitted a similar plan to the Live Nation plan. The Golden State Warriors owner, a man who is filthy, 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 filthy rich, the Golden State Warriors owner, Joe Lacob. He said, if we go multiple seasons without fans in the stands of NBA games, he said the National Basketball Association is not a sustainable business model. He said, we can sustain one year without fans in the stands. But if we're in this position in year two with no basketball fans in the arena, the NBA could crumble and be no more because it could not cover its overhead. As a result, this Golden State Warriors owner, who's got a background, a background in biotechnology. He's a venture capitalist in biotechnology. He has a master's degree in public health from UCLA. This guy said, I'm going to spend $30 million of my own money with the Golden State Warriors to figure out how I can get my arena at 50% capacity for this coming year that's gonna start right around Christmas. If I can't get my arena to 50% capacity after spending $30 million of my own money through testing and, and, and vaccine programs and protocol programs, then I'm not sure this league is sustainable. That is huge. 
Do you hear what a multi-billionaire is saying? A multi-billionaire is saying, if we cannot get people into basketball arenas, we cannot sustain this league. Same thing with Live Nation and Ticketmaster and live concerts. Private business is busting its hump to solve a global pandemic. And the best innovation I have found as an entrepreneur and business owner, multiple business owner, the, mo the best innovation I have found happens at the private business level because people's livelihoods are dependent on the freaking innovation. The best innovation does not happen at the public policy, civic duty, elected official level. It just doesn't. It happens in private business. And the Golden State Warriors and Live Nation are literally trying to save multiple industries. Live music, live sports, hospitality, tourism, events and weddings. I'll get to your comments momentarily. Before I do, there's eight Tennessee volunteer football coaches that are refusing pay cuts including the offensive coordinator and the defensive coordinator. Tennessee's athletic department has been ravaged by COVID. Why? Because fans can't go to football games, and that's one of their key profit centers. Because fans can't go to football games in Knoxville, Tennessee's asked its coaches across the department to take pay cuts. Eight of the assistants on the football team said, no, I'm not going to take pay cuts. And now Tennessee, its administration, doesn't know what to do. Miami and Virginia Tech, 12 o'clock kick, Saturday on the ACC network. The Hurricanes are number nine in the nation. Virginia Tech is the two-point favorite at home. Vegas thinking in an upset. Hurricanes, nine in the country. Virginia Tech is the two-point favorite. Louisville's at UVA. The over-under um, is higher than I would think. The line is three and a half. UVA is 2-4, and four, Louisville's 2-5, and five, a must-win game for the Wahoos. A must-win game for the Wahoos if they want to finish 500 or better and play in the postseason. UVA, a 3.5-point favorite against Louisville and Scott Stadium. Give the Instagram some love. We have the third largest Instagram community in Central Virginia. UVA is number one. The city of Charlottesville is number two. We're the third largest. If you care about news small and medium-sized business, restaurants, elected officials, hotels, real estate, tourism, hospitality. If you care about the community, follow I Love Siebel on Instagram, please. I Love Siebel on Instagram. $288 on a Ting fiber internet savings. We use Ting for this show. It is the best internet out there, and we have an opportunity for you to get the best internet, and it's not even close, at a $288 reduction in price. Only through this link, ilovesevil.ting.com, ilovesevil.ting.com. I'll remind everybody to watch the I Love Seville Daily Digest, the entire show in five minutes or less, five days a week at five o'clock on the I Love Seville Network. It's this show in five minutes or less at five o'clock, five days a week, the I Love Seville Daily Digest. All right, Judah, let's get to some comments on the feed. Oh, and next week, um, Erin King at Feast, she's given us um, multiple gift cards to give away to the grocery store in the Purple Building. So next week, we're going to start rolling out on this program prizes every single show, and the prizes will be offered to you based on liking and sharing the show and you offering perspective in the comment section that makes us as viewers, listeners, as hosts, as producers better. And that happens often on this program, is you guys help educate me. For example, I did not know that there were roughly 800 employees at State Farm. You guys told me that. Kevin Higgins, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate you, Kevin Higgins, for sharing that. I appreciate you, Andre Xavier, for sharing that. Um, let's get to some comments now. Judah, how are you feeling over there? Wonderful. Good. I'm glad you're feeling wonderful. Um, Scott Ehrenworth, the Esquire, who is watching in Virginia Beach. Jerry, I hope people are getting holiday pies from Paradox Pastry, Kievel and Kievel, and the pie chest. Scott, very good comment, my friend. 
Our Thanksgiving pie is an apple pie from the pie chest. And we hooked Neil Williamson up this morning with a free pie for Thanksgiving from the pie chest, courtesy of Yona and Keith Smith and Real Talk. Kevin Higgins, State Farm, Pantops has 800 employees. It's S&P Global, no longer SNL. Thank you. That's from James Watson. James Watson also says housing supply is still crazy low and Charlottesville is still one of the best places to live in the country. So I don't see an exodus of state farmers leaving the area and hurting the economy. James Watson says, James Watson, I'm not so sure the majority of state farmers live in Charlottesville right now. My bet is most state farmers live in Fluvanna, Greene County, Waynesboro, or Augusta County. We can tell our favorite leaf blower outside the Macklin building that it's okay for him to blow the leaves, Judah, if he's looking for a green light. I don't mind. Um, I do, James says, I do wonder how well the high rises that are being built downtown will gain full occupancy for office jobs. There are a number of new projects. The parking lot at ACAC downtown, have you seen it recently? That project has had massive movement. I'm going to say this right now. The parking lot at ACAC in downtown Charlottesville. I'm a member of ACAC downtown Charlottesville. I'm there all the time. The parking lot, the big parking lot, okay? Not the one, the, the, the large one on the side. That parking lot when ACAC was clicking before COVID, it was always full. That parking lot was not just always full. People were parking illegally on that parking lot, on that grassy knoll, that little grassy hill up there, and also kind of like boxing in cars. The demand for ACAC is so great. Then COVID hit. Right before COVID hit, the question on this network was, if we shut down that parking lot at ACAC, where are the members of ACAC going to park? Are they going to take up the open spaces around the downtown mall? Everyone was concerned about that. Then COVID-19 hit, ACAC capacity has not eclipsed 25% inside since the pandemic. And that big time Apex project on that side parking lot, no one's even paying attention to it now because they don't have to drive their two, three, and four tons of metal to that parking lot to park before going into the gym. So the best thing that happened to that project from an optics and from not infuriating locals is COVID. Now that project doesn't have the parking conundrum it has to deal with. Co-Construct has also got a major project coming downtown. Oliver Kutner does. I, I think it's a legitimate question, all this construction being downtown, will the demand there be for um, this new construction? I think it's a fair question. Um, Neil Williamson's posting about youth sports. Why don't we have more youth sports tournament in this area? The Charlottesville Almoral, what is it, soccer? The soccer organization of Charlottesville Almoral, they are well-funded, super talented with their teams. Why isn't there a big-time soccer tournament in this area? There's one in Richmond. I remember growing up, I did travel soccer for the Williamsburg Soccer Club. Twice a year, my family, my brother, myself, our soccer team, all the parents and siblings from our soccer team, and soccer teams from all over the mid-Atlantic, we would flock to Charlottesville, North Carolina for an epic soccer tournament that was a three, four-day extravaganza. We were getting there Friday, taking a half day from school and getting hotels Friday night and Saturday night and leaving Sunday, eating out and spending money all Friday traveling down and all Sunday coming back. Why isn't there a major soccer tournament in this area, lacrosse tournament, mountain biking race in this area? Have you not wondered that? I would do things so differently if I was on council or the board of supervisors. <laughs> I just so differently. My question is, with my three businesses, I'm able to go into an office with my team and say, we're doing this. I want it done today. And I expect these results. Go. And we get results. Obviously, I wouldn't be able to do something like that in an elected official position, but I would certainly try to drive momentum a little faster and harder than it's happening. This red tape nonsense is just 
such like the antithesis of being a number one at a business or an entrepreneur? Is that why, Neil, that Albemarle County refused to allow the lights on the soccer fields? That's why we don't have the tournament? Is that, is that what it is, Neil? That the county refused to allow lights on the soccer fields? So because of the lights, we don't have the window for the tournament? It, if that's the case, I learned something. And not allowing lights on those soccer fields is ridiculous. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Malik that's doing that. Am I right on that, Neil, that it's Malik? Um, Joanna Spagoni from Woodard Properties, um, Susan Steimart, if you're watching, Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust, Woodard Properties, hi Jerry, it's Joanna Spagoni, we at Woodard Properties think the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust is a fantastic organization that helps provide affordable housing in the Charlottesville area. Woodard Properties is excited to pledge $500 to this effort in our community. A big thank you to Susan Steimart and the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust. Great job, everyone. That's from Woodard Properties and spokeswoman Joanna Spagoni, who I think is A-plus people. I love Joanna Spagoni. Uh, Joanna, make sure you tell Rick this. I beat Rick in a ping pong battle. Rick Spagoni. Rick, you remember. It was about 15 years ago. I beat Rick Spagoni in ping pong. Five Kappa Psi brothers playing ping pong over there. All right, I got to get out of here. I got to get to work. I got a meeting. You guys are the best. Daily Dodges is at 5 o'clock. We're back on Monday. I want you to mark your calendars for this show on Tuesday on Real Talk with Keith Smith of the Yes Team Realtors. We're going to do a show that analyzes the eight or ten most underutilized or underperforming properties in the city of Charlottesville. I mean, just off the top of my head, Kim's Market on Cherry Avenue is horribly underutilized and underperforming, right? An entrance to Fifeville is a derelict shadow of its former self grocery store that has a pothole ridden parking lot and a fence that covers pretty much the entire property. The Wild Wing Cafe, the Amtrak parking lot, Alan Kajin owns that. Alan's in San Francisco. Alan. That parking lot is horribly underutilized. The Wild Wing parking lot on West Main, I mean, what is that, just an a empty parking lot right in the heart of the city? Horribly underutilized. How about uh, the, the extorting emperor of empty lots, Johnny Dewberry? Johnny Dewberry of Hotlanta, the quarterback of the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, one-time quarterback of Georgia Tech. Johnny Dewberry, the extorting emperor of empty lots and his Dewberry Hotel. The Dewberry Hotel on the downtown mall, horribly underutilized. That's three right there. James Watson came up with the, uh, the, um, the parking lot across from World of Beer. Remember when Sweet House, the cupcake place, used to be there? That parking lot on West Main from World of Beer? Let's call that the, what are we going to call that? Because we already have the Wild Wing parking lot. Why don't we call that the Sweet House cupcake parking lot? That's four. Those are four. We only have 10.2 square miles in Charlottesville. And in 10.2 square miles in Charlottesville, without even thinking, we've come up with what? 10 acres? Maybe not 10. Seven acres? If you took Kim's Market, the Wild Wing Cafe Amtrak parking lot, the Dewberry Hotel, and the Sweet House parking lot on West Main, that's four right there. Do you think that's 10 acres? That's probably between eight or 10 acres right there, right? Am I right? Off the top of our head, those are four pieces of property that are underperforming, underutilizing in a town that doesn't have enough land. We're gonna analyze even more on the, uh, I love, on, on Real Talk on Tuesdays. Um, Over 20 years ago, they did not allow John Grisham to put lights on his North Garden baseball fields. That's right, in Covesville. I remember that. I think I was like a rookie reporter for the Daily Progress during that time, and Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe had me cover that story for the sports department. John Grisham was trying to build an epicenter for baseball, the nation's pastime, in Covesville, and they kiboshed him left and right. 
Um, Barbara Lundgren says, Mark Minsker, Mark Minster, you have your daddy's smile. Why don't we close on that note? Put Mark Minster's photo back on screen and we'll get out of here. Mark Minster, back home with his family after brain surgery, second generation owner of Minster's, Stonefield, UVA Corner, and online. Mark is A plus people. I am a God-fearing man. I prayed for you and your family. I'm glad you're back home. You are class, class people, Mark Minster. Thank you for being in Charlottesville. Your family, too. All right, I'm going to get out of here. See you Monday. Daily Dodges at 5. I'm Jerry Miller for Judah Wickhauer. See you. I love Siebel Show, baby. Take care. I, I like seeing that with Mark back.